the refrain is going to be sung by us. Ready? We're going to try this. If it doesn't work, it doesn't work. Okay. Um, we start with G first. Then you come up with U R. Here we go. And. Sing verse two. You're gonna sing verse two. Um, okay, so you start with G first. Go. Take my sin, my cross, my shame. Let's walk and I bless your name. You are my own. invites to his table all who love him, who earnestly repent of their sin and seek to live in peace with one another. Therefore, let us confess our sin before God and one another. Let us pray together. We confess, gracious God, that we have not lived as you have longed for us to live. We have failed to love you, and above all else, we have been blind to our neighbor's needs. We have spoken when silence would have been golden and failed to speak on behalf of the voiceless. We have trusted everything but you to lift us from the darkness. Forgive us, dear Lord. Cleanse our hearts. Make them more like yours. Teach us to live like Jesus. Amen. Our God is indeed gracious and merciful, slow to anger and abounding in steadfast love and forgiveness. For Jesus' sake, your sins are forgiven. Go in peace to lift up those who are down as you have been lifted up in Christ. Amen. Good morning. Good morning. The reading today is found in Isaiah chapter 40, verses 21 to 31, in today's New International Version. Do you not know? Have you not heard? Has it not been told you from the beginning? Have you not understood since the earth was founded? He sits enthroned above the circle of the earth, and his people are like grasshoppers. He stretches out the heavens like a canopy, and spreads them out like a tent to live in. He brings princes to naught and reduces the rulers of this world to nothing. No sooner are they planted, no sooner are they sown, no sooner do they take root in the ground than he blows on them and they wither and a whirlwind sweeps them away like chaff. To whom will you compare me? Or who is my equal? Says the Holy One. Lift up your eyes and look to the heavens. Who created all these? He who brings out the starry host one by one and calls them each by name. Because of his great power and mighty strength, not one of them is missing. Why do you complain, Jacob? Why, why do you say, Israel, my way is hidden from the Lord? My cause is disregarded by my God. Do you not know? 
Have you not heard? The Lord is the everlasting God, the creator of the ends of the earth. He will not grow tired or weary, and his understanding no one can fathom. He gives strength to the weary and increases the power of the weak. Even youth grow tired and weary, and young men stumble and fall. But those who hope in the Lord will renew their strength. They will soar on wings like eagles. They will run and not be weary. They will walk and not be tired, be faint. The next reading is in Psalm chapter 147, verses 1 to 11 and 20c. Praise the Lord! How good it is to sing praises to our God! How pleasant and fitting to praise him! The Lord builds up Jerusalem. He gathers the exiles of Israel. He heals the brokenhearted and binds up their wounds. He determines the number of the stars and calls them each by name. Great is our Lord and mighty in power. His understanding has no limit. The Lord sustains the humble, but casts the wicked to the ground. Sing to the Lord with grateful praise. Make music to our God on the harp. He covers the sky with clouds. He supplies the earth with rain and makes grass grow on the hills. He provides food for the cattle and for the young ravens when they call. His pleasure is not in the strength of the horse, nor his delight in the power of human legs. The Lord delights in those who fear him, who put their hope in his unfailing love. Praise the Lord. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. seated. And at this time, I'm going to invite those that are leading our ministry teams, the life of the church, to come forward at this time. Linda, Phyllis, <laughs> who's on nominating? Anne, Jane, Mom, Brian, <laughs> Ellie. Well, is anybody else? Barb's on nominating, right? Hmm? Marva, yeah, Marv. Can you come up, Marv? Don't if you don't if you don't feel like you want can. Don't if you are uncomfortable. Okay. Come on up. Not everybody. Well Marva's coming up. I see we have 
two new guys up in the balcony this morning. They've been put off probation. And so let us give them a round of applause and thank them for stepping up. We asked for, we asked for help and people showed up. So thank you for serving us in that way this morning. Dear friends, you have been called by God and you have been chosen by the people of God for leadership in the life of this church. Taking on these ministries is a blessing and it is a serious responsibility. It recognizes your special gifts and talents and calls you to work among us, for us, and for God. In love, we thank you for accepting your obligation and we challenge you to offer your very best to the Lord, to this people, and to our ministry in the world. Live a life in Christ and make him known in your witness and in your work as leaders. Today we install you as ministry team leaders. Do you this day acknowledge yourself a faithful disciple of Jesus Christ? Do you? Will you devote yourself to the service of God in the world? Will you? Will you so live that you enable your ministry to be a ministry of love and peace? Will you? Will you do all in your power to be responsible to the task for which you have been chosen? Will you? Dear friends, rejoice that God has provided laborers for the ministry of our church. Will you do all in your power, all that you can to assist and encourage them in the responsibilities to which they have been called, giving them your cooperation, your counsel if it's asked of, and certainly your prayers. Will you? Let us pray. Extend your hand of blessing toward them. Almighty God, pour out your blessing upon these your servants who have been given particular ministries in your church. Grant them grace to give themselves wholeheartedly in your service. Keep before them the example of our Lord who did not think first of himself but gave himself for us all. Let them share in his ministry and consecration that they may enter into his joy. Guide them in their work. Reward their faithfulness with the knowledge that through them your purposes are accomplished. Through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Let us give God thanks for these service leaders. Thank you. Thank you, Melly. Thank you, Brian. Our boys and girls are dismissed to nursery or breakout at this time as we now prepare to give, bringing your gifts and trusting that God will transform them into the power and strength for the world, a world in need of healing and hope. Let us receive this morning's offering.
let us pray. Bless these gifts which your creative strength and power, O oh God, that those who need to know your love and feel your presence may be blessed by the gifts we have been given this day. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. We have some joys and prayer uh, concerns this morning and some announcements to share with everyone. So we have a joy, and that's where we'll begin. It's from Pat Heminger. They have a new great-granddaughter. Another great-granddaughter. <laughs> and Helen Dan, Dan. Danny, Danny Matzer. Helen Danny Matzer, granddaughter to Diane and Richard Rockefeller. Congratulations. Wonderful. This is the twi oh, hey, I'm seeing, I keep reading. Learn more. This is the 21st grandchild for Earl and Pat. Great grandchild. Wow. 21st. <sighs> Busy family. Um, prayer, <laughs> prayer concern. Uh, continue to pray for Earl Heminger that he can come home. Let us lift Earl in our prayers. And prayers for safe travels. And please continue to pray for Connor Hicks. His operation was a success, although his recovery has been a roller coaster. He, had, he was doing better, and they thought perhaps they were headed home. However, he had another setback just yesterday. So let us pray for this young man in his time of healing. Pray for his parents as they, they need the strength to, to withstand this time. And pray for the grandparents who are flying back and forth. One grandma is relieving the other grandma, um, probably as we speak. Or, um, so let us pray for that family in their time of need. Some announcements uh, to put before you. Organizational meeting. Uh, it will be at 545 on Tuesday. So all of you who are just installed, that's for you. 7 o'clock will be your first leadership team meeting um, for some of you at 7 o'clock. Valentine's dinner is Wednesday at 5.30. That's going to be a lot of fun. $5. All homemade. It's good stuff. And so please invite people and come out. And as I said last week, if you play your cards right, that's two meals out. No cooking. So come on and have some fun and fellowship with us. Uh, if you could RSVP to the office, that would be really appreciated. Uh, there's a wedding here at church this weekend. Uh, next Sunday, newsletter articles are due. Scholarship articles are due the 23rd. Uh, we're going bowling the week the kids off, uh, are off from school, Tuesday, February 17th, 12 until we're done. Cost is $6, and if you'd like to go, please let us know ahead of time so we can let the bowling alley know how many are coming. We'd love to have a nice group to come. Ash Wednesday, as we said, is February 18th. We're going to start with a pancake supper at 6 and have a service at 7. If you're interested in making the United Church of Phelps your home, we invite you to join us for a lunch following service on February 22nd. And new members are planning to join on March the 15th. We have the first chicken barbecue of the year, and that is going to be... March the 1st, right after church. Pre-sale tickets start today. And Marsha will be at the front door with the tickets, but you can buy them from out of the office as well. And after Tuesday, team leaders will have tickets as well. Holy Thursday will be held at the Shortsville Presbyterian Church. And we are still looking for two more disciples. And so if you think that would be something you would be interested in, please let me know in the next couple of days. That would be really helpful and nice. 
and the choir has been going to be asked to participate as well, so it'll be a nice to have a nice showing from Phelps. Are there other announcements or joys or concerns that need to be raised this morning? Kathy? Uh, if you would keep Doug and me in your prayers for safe travel as we go to Arizona on Wednesday and come home next Sunday. And more importantly, I want to thank all of you who have been praying for my uh, cousin's grandson, Wyatt, to tell you what prayer can do. Last week, the MRSA infection was in the bone. They were looking at amputation. He got second and third opinions this week. They have said that they can save the foot. MRSA is receding. They're moving him closer to home, just a few minutes from home. They're keeping him on the IV antibiotics for now, but he has turned the corner. So That's thank wonderful. Thank you for praying for Wyatt and uh, look what God can do. Praise be to God. Praise be to God. Let us turn to the Lord in prayer. God of this day, God of all days, we come to you in prayer. We join together in a common hope to know your peace, to receive your wisdom, and to witness your light that shines even in the darkness. Your light shines, O oh Lord, through the cracks in our lives, but all we can see are the gaps, tasks left undone, Relationships more tangled today than they were yesterday. Disorder that goes deep beyond our own understanding. We confess that our heart comes unhinged and our actions give way to regret. Oh God, do not let the darkness overcome us. Cover up our multitude of sins. For we know that it is only in your deep forgiveness that we can know your peace. It is only in your abiding presence that we can know your peace. Only when we open our eyes can we see your light that shines. And so shine in our midst. Smooth out the rough places. Hollow our steps. Steady our feet. Make holy our actions. Bless every day. Bless every hour. Bless every minute. Knowing that you reorder the chaos of our lives, we come bearing prayers for all. For the least and the lost. For those whom we love. For the leaders who guide us in all the world. We lift to you today our spoken concerns. We lift to you Connor and his family in their time of need. We lift to you your son Earl Heminger and ask for your hand of blessing and healing. We continue to pray for Wyatt that that corner that he's turned, he can continue to follow that path. We pray for safe travels. We pray for Doug and Kathy as they travel. And we rejoice with Earl and Pat and Richard and Diane and the birth and the gift of new life of Helen. We raise to you today all of our petitions, knowing that you hear us. Give each person here a spirit of hope, a spirit of promise, and the strength to journey in faith every day. God, we come to you knowing that you hear us and that you are with us. You struggle for us, you suffer for us, and you live in us. Be and abide with us, now and always, I pray, through Christ our Lord. Amen. Our gospel lesson this morning comes from the gospel according to Mark, the very first chapter beginning with the 29th verse. Hear God's word for us today. As soon as they left the synagogue, they entered the house of Simon and Andrew with James and John. Now Simon's mother-in-law was in bed with a fever, and they told him about her at once. He came and took her by the hand and lifted her up. Then the fever left her, and she began to serve them. 
That evening at sundown they brought to him all who were sick or possessed with demons. And the whole city was gathered round the door. And he cured many who were sick with various diseases and cast out many demons. And he would not permit the demons to speak because they knew him. In the morning, while it was still very dark, he got up and he went out to a deserted place. And there he prayed, and Simon and his companions hunted for him. When they found him, they said to him, Everyone is searching for you. He answered, Let us go on to the neighboring towns, so that I may proclaim the message there also. For that is what I came out to do. And he went throughout Galilee, proclaiming the message in their synagogues and casting out the demons. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Now, this morning, I have to tell you a gospel lesson where the words Simon's mother-in-law in it is just too good to resist. Now, most of you know my mother-in-law, Pam. A sweeter person you couldn't wish to meet. She loves her family. She is a great babysitter. And I'm blessed that she's mine. But I just can't help to offer up a couple mother-in-law jokes if you promise not to tell her about the sermon. <laughs> I haven't spoken to my mother-in-law in 18 months. I don't like to interrupt her. <laughs> I just got back from a pleasure trip. I took my mother-in-law to the airport. <laughs> How many mother-in-laws does it take to change a light bulb? One. She just holds it up there and waits for the world to revolve around her. <laughs> My mother-in-law fell down a wishing well last week and I was amazed. I never knew they worked. <laughs> My mother-in-law threatened me one day. She said, I'm going to dance on your grave. And I said, I hope so. I'm going to be buried at sea. <laughs> Behind every successful man stands a devoted wife and a surprised mother-in-law. The ten verses of Mark's Gospel, however, have a very different attitude towards mother-in-laws than those jokes do. Did you notice that during the reading that after Jesus healed her of her fever, she got up and she began serving her guests a meal? Now, reading that with modern eyes, we might wonder, what in the world is going on here? It's almost as though Jesus healed the woman so that she could get up and fix him supper. But of course, nothing can be further from the truth. In first century Palestine, the privilege of serving an honored guest was one given to the senior woman of the household. It was counted a right, it was an honor, and it was a privilege. Now, Simon's wife might have served the guest, especially when her mother had been so ill. But clearly, serving guests was what her mother wanted to do as soon as she was well enough to do it. It was a matter of honor, and it was a token of both the perfectness and the immediateness of the cure, and of her gratitude to the great physician, Jesus Christ. This isn't about servitude. Have you noticed how often Jesus' healing miracles are about more than just restoring someone to health physically? As soon as she is healed, Simon's mother-in-law is immediately restored to her position of honor. When Jesus heals someone, the healing doesn't just deal with those physical symptoms. It also invariably has the effect of bringing people from one state of being to another. Jesus seeks to restore not just health, but life, and life in all of its fullness. In first century Palestine, sick people were often treated as though their illness was their fault. Based on some ideas that are expressed in the Old Testament, people believed that illnesses were a result of sin. Either someone, something that that sick person did, or perhaps something that that sick person's parents did. Sickness was seen as a punishment, 
And sinners needed to be shunned, and they needed to be excluded from the society and community. Indeed, they had to be kept on the margins. And they were reduced to begging. Jesus Christ, however, sought to break down that notion. He understood the causes of sickness to be far more complex. It reminded me this week of the story of the paralyzed man, the one who's let down through the roof in Luke chapter 5. Jesus plays with these ideas in public. First he says to the paralyzed man, he says, Your sins are forgiven. Demonstrating that he has the divine power to forgive sins. But the man was still lying there. He was still laying on his stretcher. While Jesus is disputing with the religious leaders of his day whether or not it makes any difference to forgive sin or just to offer healing. But Jesus turns to the man and he says to him, you know the story, get up, take your stretcher, take your mat, and walk home. It was Jesus' words of healing healing, which restored that man to health. Not the forgiveness of sins, although that was freely offered. Sickness didn't, in Jesus' view, arise out of sin. Sickness is not a punishment, although it can certainly arise out of human greed, human refusal to seek wisdom, seek medical help. After being healed by Jesus, all people are able to be restored to human society. Simon's mother-in-law is restored. She's restored to her position of the household and the privilege of serving her most important guests. Lepers are restored to their family and to their friends and to their communities. The blind are no longer reduced to begging at the side of the road. This for Jesus is one of the signs of the kingdom of God. It's an echo of the words that his mother Mary sang in her Magnificat. He fills the hungry with good things. He exalts the humble and the meek. He shows mercy to everybody from one generation to the next and to the next. Interesting, interestingly, in these days, we're far more aware of some of the causes of disease. And we are in danger of giving in to that same blame culture that Jesus tried to combat in his ministry. Now that medical science has given us reason to believe that low weight and moderate exercise and eating the five a day are the cure for all ailments, we tend to cast more blame. How often do we hear, how often have you or I said, it must be her fault. She hasn't looked after herself. I have told him he should have stopped drinking, he should have stopped smoking, he should have stopped eating, or going outside without a coat on. We quickly blame people for their illnesses, attributing it to some sin on their part. And when we do that, we fail to understand, unlike Jesus, that the causes of sickness are often far more complex. Our society today is driven by mass marketing, consumerism, and the easy availability of sugar and alcohol and fat. We live highly pressured, stressed out lives. And we desperately try to keep up with the Joneses. How easy is it for us to point to someone else's illness and say, it's their fault. They didn't exercise enough or they overdid it with their exercise. They ate too much or they didn't eat enough. We, we seem to take perverse delight in blaming people for their sicknesses rather than understanding that people live the way they do because human life, human life is messy. Human life is messy. See? Human life is messy. We burp during the pastor's sermon sometimes. 
But living these ways are sometimes the way people cope, for good or bad. Jesus' response to the messiness of human suffering was found. First, he turned over the concept that sickness was linked in any way to personal sin. But secondly, he also embraced human suffering itself. By taking all that the society of his day could throw at him, even to the point of death on a Roman cross of torture. Jesus entered fully into the messiness of human life. And this is, I think, part of what it means to say that Jesus took on the sins of the world. He took the messiness of human suffering with him to the cross. He allowed human messiness to overwhelm him to the point of dying because of it. Human messiness, human weirdness, human suffering, human pride, human greed. All of it was nailed to the cross with Christ. And then? And then Jesus transcended it. The story of the resurrection is the story of how God has the power to transcend and overcome all human messiness. Through the resurrection, God offers us a powerful symbol of the way that life can be. New life. Life lived to the full, put suffering and messiness in the past. Notice how in the days after the resurrection, the days after Easter, Jesus offers forgiveness to who? He forgives Peter. Now, Peter denied Jesus as being the Messiah one time? No. Twice? No. Three times? Yes. Three times. Pointing out that there is no room for blame. There's no room for finger pointing in the resurrection kingdom of God. Instead, blame and finger-pointing give way to forgiveness and understanding and love, mercy, and grace. Peter, who denied Jesus, was offered forgiveness and then given a job to do. He said, Peter, if you love me, then go and feed my sheep. Go into all the world and be my disciple. Just like his mother-in-law. Peter finds himself restored through healing and forgiveness to his proper role in society. So, what might we take from this gospel story? What might we take from Jesus' attitude towards sickness and from his attitude towards the messiness of human lives, our lives? Of all people, Christians should understand that sin, human messiness, is endemic. And of all people, Christians, like Christ, should be willing to offer forgiveness and healing whenever sin is encountered. We are people who should understand that everyone messes up because we ourselves have messed up a time or two. My friends, I have to tell you something. I love this church. And I love its people. I love you. My pastoral heart is with you. I love the commitment that you have to supporting each other when you're sick. Or to fundraising keep the ministry alive. Or to working to feed the community or singing in the choir. I love that you are motivated to make a place for any newcomer that walks through our doors. I want us to be the kind of community, faith community that accepts unreservedly, without any surprise whatsoever, that all human beings are messy. Like Jesus, I want us to be be those who simply understand that none of us is perfect. 
Every single one of us is striving to be better every day. But we will sometimes fail. We will often stumble. And we will even mess up. When we watch someone else stumble or fall, I want us to be the kind of faith community which says to itself, before I criticize that person, I need to walk a mile in their shoes. I want us to be the kind of faith community which continually and constantly offers forgiveness, healing, and understanding to each other, and indeed, even to ourselves. Let us be the kind of faith community which offers understanding to those whose choices in life, fed by all sorts of unimaginable stresses, lead them to make what seems to us strange or poor decisions. Let's be those who, when we find someone falling over, we reach down and we pick them up. Let's be those people who belong to a faith community of love and understanding. Because that's the kind of faith community Christ calls us to be. This morning I want to leave you with a simple picture of the great work that the great physician does and is doing among us and all around us. Richard Seltzer is a distinguished surgeon and he's a professor, a medical professor at Yale. And he wrote a book entitled Lesson and Mortal Lessons. And in it he talks about having to operate on a young woman. She has a cancerous growth on her cheek. And in doing that surgery, he had to cut the nerve which controlled the muscles of her mouth. And when she looked at her misshapen mouth in the mirror, she asked the doctor if it was going to always be that way. And he looked at her and said, yes. She then nodded and she lay there quietly. But her young husband, in a moment, bent over her and smiled and said to her, I like it. And then he shaped his mouth to hers and he kissed her. to show her that their kiss still worked. Seltzer wrote that he felt as though he were in the presence of God. Brothers and sisters, he was. The work of the great physician is to come to us in the twisted shapes of our lives and to shape his love to fit us. To pour his love into us. God's love is perfectly shaped for you and for me and for our neighbors and for all our needs. There's no room in the kingdom of God for blame. Jesus didn't blame Simon's mother-in-law for her illness. He didn't blame any of the sick or lame that came to him for help. He reached out, he touched them, he bent over, and he kissed them with love. Our Jesus only offers healing, love and restoration. And he calls us to do the same. Because after all, there is no room for blame. There's no room for unkindness. Only love and healing in the kingdom of our God. And the same is true when we come to the table of our Lord. Let us prepare to encounter love and healing as we receive Christ in the bread and in the cup broken and poured out perfectly for us. To the glory of God and all God's people said,
The Lord be with you. Lift up your hearts. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is right and a good and joyful thing always and everywhere to give thanks to you, Almighty God, Creator of heaven and earth. You formed us in your image and breathed into us the breath of life. When we turned away and our love failed, your love remained steadfast. You delivered us from captivity, made covenant to be our sovereign God, and spoke to us through your prophets, who looked for that day when justice shall roll down like waters, and righteousness like an ever-flowing stream. When nations shall not lift up sword against nation, neither shall they learn war anymore. And so with your people on earth and all the company of heaven, we praise your name and join their unending hymn. Holy, holy, holy Lord. God of power and might, heaven and earth are full of your glory. Hosanna in the highest. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest. Holy are you and blessed is your Son, Jesus Christ. Your Spirit anointed him to preach good news to the poor, to proclaim release to the captives, recovering of sight to the blind, to set at liberty those who are oppressed, to announce the time had come when you would save your people. He healed the sick, fed the hungry, and ate with sinners. By the baptism of his suffering, his death, and his resurrection, he gave birth to his church, delivered us from slavery to sin and death, and made with us a new covenant by water and spirit. At his ascension, you exalted him to sit and reign at your right hand. On the night in which he gave himself up for us, he took bread, gave thanks to God and broke the bread, gave it to his disciples and said, Take, eat, this is my body which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. When the supper was over, he took the cup, gave thanks to God and gave it to his disciples and said, Drink from this, all of you. This is my blood of the new covenant. Pour it out for you and for many for the forgiveness of sins. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. And so, in remembrance of these, your mighty acts in Jesus Christ, we offer ourselves in praise and thanksgiving as a holy and living sacrifice in union with Christ's offering for us as we proclaim the mystery of faith. Christ has died. Christ is risen. Christ will come again. Pour out your Holy Spirit upon us gathered here and upon these gifts of bread and juice. Make them be for us the body and blood of Christ that we may be for the world the body of Christ, redeemed by his blood. By your Spirit, make us one with Christ and one with each other and one in ministry to all the world until Christ comes in final victory and we feast at the heavenly banquet. Through your Son, Jesus Christ, with the Holy Spirit, in your holy church, all honor and glory is yours, Almighty God, now and forever. Amen. And now with the confidence of children of God, let us pray as we've been taught to pray, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our sins, as we forgive those who sin against us. And lead us not to temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. The body of Christ has been broken for us. The blood of Christ shed for us. Those assisting with communion, please come forward at this time.
They sang a hymn together, and we'll do the same. Let us stand and sing our closing song, He Touched Me, number 367.
May you know the love of God and the grace of Jesus Christ and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit. Touch someone this week with your healing and with your love. Go in peace. Amen.